Father in heaven, we do come before you again this morning as we're reminded of the truths that we have in Christ. And Lord, if we're honest, we don't contemplate that enough. Thank you, Lord, for these students who are all here who desire to, to know you, who are here at this camp this weekend and who are hearing from you and growing in you. And Lord, it is our desire to continue to grow in you and even the practical matters of life. Uh, Lord, friendship is important to you and it should be important to us. So, Father, I pray that this topic is handled with care and in a way that honors you and extols you. So I pray, Lord, that you would work in them to give them the heart of friendship that you have, um, even within the Godhead, that, that love there. And so, Father, I pray that you would exalt yourself, that your word would go forth with clarity, and that we would be built up in further Christ-likeness. So we ask for your help now by the power of your spirit. And this is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, in your world any world, our world, friendship is important. I think we all know that. It's so important that much of your lives even revolves around friendship. I don't even think how often we realize how much we revolve your, our lives and our schedules and our priorities around friends, because it's important, and rightly so. Finding a friend, a friend group, and even fitting in with that friend or friend group. And then what happens when you even lose that friend group? Friendship is a very, very important topic and a very important issue, especially among your age group. But it doesn't really change. It just, it just really grows in that sense as you get older. So I don't think I have to argue friendship is important. It is very important. But what I think a common error that you might find is, is this. Is what you think you're pursuing in friendship is not actually friendship oftentimes. What sometimes we're going after is popularity. That I want to not just have friends, but I want to fit in. I want to have my self-esteem boosted. I want people that like me. I want to have a lot of friends. I want to fit in. And really, that's what's important. So really, when you feel like you're not fitting in, when you're not popular, when you don't have as many friends as this person, you realize, yeah, friendship is not something I don't have. I don't have good friends. But it may just be that the paradigm of friendship that you're thinking of, of this is what friendship looks like, may be skewed. And that's what happens oftentimes. We view friendship as something that I get, I benefit from. And I really think that really causes us to go off on the wrong foot. Because worldly friendships, think about any worldly friendship, believer, unbeliever, but any worldly friendships, how are those friendships built upon and how do they thrive? Like think about it. Friendships in the world, how do they thrive? Where are they built from? Common experiences. We have similar points of view. We, we have similar things that we enjoy together. Our goal is to have fun. And so really the friendships in the worldly idea is whatever is easiest whatever is most enjoyable, I have the most fun. And so therefore our friendship there is formed and it grows in that. And really what's the anchor in that friendship? Simply self. As long as I'm enjoying it, it is easy. It is simple. We, we, we have fun together. Then that is friendship. And it's basic. It's anemic. That is faulty. It's not sufficient. But hear me, it's not entirely wrong. We don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's, it's, it's not wrong to enjoy friends and to have fun together and have sh common experiences and have shared hobbies. That's not wrong. But what I'm saying is, is that oftentimes the basis of friendship is built upon what I enjoy most and what is easiest for me and what is so simple for me to thrive within that relationship. And that's when it becomes not really friendship. It's really just selfishness. So how much of your paradigm when you're thinking about friendship, is it more about what you get out of the deal versus other people? Now, I don't want to lessen the importance of friendship because it's important, but I want to stress even more what is true friendship, what is godly friendship, right? What is godly friendship? How do you define what a true friend is? Let me ask, ask you, think about it for yourself. You don't have to answer it out, but how do you define what a true friend is? How do you know that the friends in your life are actually true friends? Like, how do you know that? 
Friendship, it naturally does flow out of common interests, common points of view. So in which case, if we're talking about godly friendship, then what is the anchor of godly friendship? The common view, the common desire to make Christ known and to cherish Christ. So I really wanted to start framing it there, that if if friendship really is about common interests, common goals, then what makes godly friendship thrive and grow is the desire to cherish Christ and to see Christ exalted. So before we even talk about this conversation, I want you to search your heart. If it's your desire, is it your hungering to cherish Christ and to see Christ exalted in your life? If, if it's not there, you're not going to get far in godly friendship. And it may just be repent. That's not my goal. Lord, forgive me. I want to honor you. I want to exalt you. And so, Lord, give me the right heart, the right basis in pursuing this. Because if you do not cherish Christ, want to see Christ exalted, then godly friendship will mean nothing to you. And you will continually find your hope in the world and in other things that people can give you to make you feel good and what they can give you so that you can feel good about yourself and to feel affirmed by other people. Because think about it at the end of the day. The worldly friendship paradigm is all about people. It's about fearing people. You hear that? Fearing people. You say, I don't fear people. Well, do you want them to like you? Do you care if they don't like you? If they talk about you? Do do you do things so that you can fit in? That's fearing man. You get that? It's hard to hear. I struggle with fearing man. But that is a common struggle is to fearing people. I want people to affirm me. I want people to like me. But godly friendship is about based on one common goal. Christ must be exalted. I want to cherish Christ. That is where we begin. That's the seed here of the of the the plant of growing this friendship. So what does the Bible teach us about friendship? Because I want this to be a helpful rubric for for even you for determining the people in your life that you seek to maintain friendship with. The friends in your life that you seek to have a genuine friendship with, do they have the same perspective as you? Are they desiring to see Christ exalted? Now, it doesn't mean just if they don't, you shouldn't befriend them. But what if they hurt you? What if they backstab you? What if you lose a friendship? Or if they turn against you, then your ultimate fulfillment was never in that friendship. It was ultimately where? Where's that friendship at? If you lose them, wake up now. If you lose them and they backstab you, they turn against you. Your hope was not ultimately there because where's your hope ultimately in? Where? Where? Christ. Where? Christ. Okay, we, 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 we're, I think four people are with me. Our hope is in Christ, right? So it's not, the, the, the ultimate basis is not there, it is in Christ. So we should be seeking to build and maintain godly friendships. We have the same biblical worldview. Now hear me in this, it does not mean you should not have unchristian friends, non-Christian friends. In fact, I would argue you should have non-Christian friends. But the question is, are those non-Christian friends influencing you or are you influencing them? If you're being pulled into their riptide of their worldview, or is it vice versa? Are you impacting them or are they impacting you? You need to have non-Christian friends so that you can be a light so that you can seek to, to, to search and rescue, to proclaim, to be an ambassador of the gospel, to be a light But those friendships where you are seeking to live and talk like them, those are the friendships where that it's almost the the test of fear, man, for you. So you should have non-Christian friends. But hear me, because no one is just a friend, because either you're influencing them or they're influencing you. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. That is true. That be careful. Like the old adage is true. Be careful of the friends you keep. Like, think about the friends you have around you. If, if bad company corrupts good morals, then what does, that, what does that look like? Is that their priorities, their desires that are impacting you is corrupting good morals. Proverbs 13 verse 20 says that whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. I don't know about you, but I want to walk wisely. And I realize that when we don't do this, that there's harm that we encounter, that it is harmful when we walk with fools. Now, that that 
phrasing there, like fool, seems harsh. But the way that Proverbs exhibits, it, uh, exhibits the life of godliness, he says it's either two paths. The path of righteousness, the path of foolishness. And so there is really no in-between. Like, they're not that bad. Like, we don't get that drunk together. Like, we, we don't do that many bad things. But they're, they're just not quite there, right? you gotta, you got to be real here. Either they're walking wisely or they're walking foolishly. There's no in-between. Right. So let's not be fools ourselves and thinking that there is another way. So anyways, we want friends that we that are are influencing us in Christ. So what I'm really basing this on is just godly friendship. Again, I'm not saying we shouldn't have friends outside of Christ, uh, uh, non-Christian friends. But what I'm really looking at this this hour, so to speak, is godly friendships. That's what I'm narrowing in on. And so what does the Bible say about godly friendships? And most importantly, I think the question is, how can I be a godly friend? How can you be a godly friend? What does the Bible say about these godly friendships? And how can you be a godly friend? So how are we going to work through that? Is I want to give you four resolutions to maintain while seeking to build godly friendships. Four resolutions to maintain while seeking to build godly friendships. That if you pursue these resolutions, you make these your resolutions that you can, by God's grace, maintain, build and maintain godly friendships. So what are these resolutions? First resolution is you must be submissive. Be submissive. I want to explain what I mean by that. What do I mean by be submissive? I don't know if you noticed, but our culture prizes individualism. What is individualism? And what does that look like in our society? Now I'm actually really asking you, what is individualism? And how do you see that in our culture? Trying to stand out. Trying to stand out. Okay. That's one option, yep. Trying to be different or fit in with those who you feel like are the most popular. Okay, trying to fit in. That happens, sure. But when you think about individualism, uh, yeah. Kind of and make yourself more important. So I want you to think about the individual, right? There are a lot of cultures that have the idea of the culture is to be immersed with people, and there's a social activity, even just generally ingrained in the culture. But when you think about individualism, what is in- inherent in that word individualism? What is inherent in that word? Individualism. What do you see? What's the, what's the word in there? Individual, right? So I want to be individual. I want to be alone. I want to be set apart. I want to live my own life. I want to live in my own world, right? Where the whole idea is to be separate, where I will not let anyone in beyond a certain point. That I'll let you in, but only as so much I feel comfortable. That you even think of like, I'm I'm going to pick on in our culture, like especially more conservative circles, like the idea of like, let's flee to Idaho. Let's get a land with 50 acres so no one can come by. And then where's the fellowship at? It's, it's nowhere because it's by yourself. Our culture prizes that individualism. I have my own rights. It's about me. It's about what I want. I want to be the individual. Like you can't tell me what I want to do. I want to do what I want. It's all about me. And what happens is that is when you have that mindset, you separate yourself from God's good design of friendship. That God has made you a relational being. Think about who God is. If God is love, how is it that God is eternally love? Even before he made the earth. There was no, we were here for him to love us. But how is it that God is eternally love? Because our God is a Trinitarian God. That there is an eternal love within the Godhead. That before even time existed, before you were here, there was a love between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And this is eternal. That God himself is love. John chapter 3, verse 35, when Jesus says that the Father loves the Son. This is an ongoing love. And as image bearers, you're an image bearer. You're made in the image of God. And you know how God has made you? (laughs) He has not made you to be an individualist. He made you a relational being. Do you hear that? That God made you a relational being. That you need relationships. You need friendships. Like you cannot thrive, especially as a Christian, without healthy relationships. And the problem is many of us try to do it, but you can't do it. 
So I think it's fair to say that the essence of godly friendship is this. The essence of godly friendship is love. It's love. At the end of the day, it's really about love. That we ought to seek to love one another. Because oftentimes, the flip side of this is we idolize friendship, as I said. And we, we look, what can I get out of this? But love is looking toward other people. And the idolization of friendship is looking toward what I get out of it. But if the essence of godly friendship is love, then we're looking at what is good for the other person. That friendships are about love. If there's no love, there's no godly friendship. One of the greatest friendships in the Bible, where do you think? When you think of friendship, the greatest picture of friendship in the Bible, what, what, what are you thinking of, Lucy? David and, oh. Jonathan. David and Jonathan. David and Jonathan, right? Perfect example of that. You guys are familiar with essentially the story of David and Jonathan, right? We're going to look at it briefly here in First, in first Samuel. So if you have your Bible, well, you should have your Bible. I would go to First uh, Samuel chapter 13. But this picture here of David and Jonathan are a common picture of friendship in the Bible that I really want to unpack for us. I still remember when I was in college and one of my, my, my roommate from my freshman year in college, he came out of the closet to me as a homosexual. I went to a Christian university and we were roommates and about halfway through the year, he, 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 he said to me, he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm a homosexual. And he was essentially telling me and kind of expecting me to kind of affirm him in this and support him. And at that time, like I wasn't like too much theology. I wasn't too grounded in it, but I knew enough to say like, hey, I still love you as a person, but I can't affirm that. I can't affirm sin. I'll still treat you the same way. I'm still going to love you. I'm not going to disrespect you, but I can't affirm that. And we started talking about it. I was like, the reason why, because scripture says it's a sin. Like, it's not my opinion, but this is what God says. I'm just the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. And one of the defenses he used toward me was how God does approve of homosexuality. And you know how? He, he, he told me about the story of David and Jonathan. And he looked at their relationship and said, this was not just a friendship. This was a homosexual relationship. That is the most vile, perverse abuse of God's word. That you're taking this picture of friendship that God has designed to give him glory and to help his people and pervert it and say it's something other than that. And there's still people today in Christianity, in liberal circles, I'm sorry, in Christianity, in liberal circles, who will say and use this picture of David and Jonathan as a proof passage to support that. But you miss the boat here when you do that, that severe abuse to God's word. Because I want us to see here, this picture here of friendship, this is just one of the pictures, and how God has used it to ex- exalt himself, but also strengthen him. What you see, the big picture of 1 Samuel is about kingship. It's about kingship. It's about the king that God has established for his people. And in chapters 13 through 14, you have a couple seemingly just random accounts here where, where Saul is being disobedient. Saul is who? Who's Saul? He's a king, right? He's being disobedient towards God a couple times. And then you see his son, Jonathan, this random other character, Jonathan, like the, the king's son. And he's over here fighting valiantly for God in battles against the Philistines. And you see this, this, this random picture here of Saul, who was God's king, but yet being disobedient towards God. And then you have Jonathan, this valiant warrior who comes in here. And it almost seems random here. But what you see here is it's setting up the play here where in the land of Israel, there is a man who fears God. And sadly, it's not the king. But the king's son, Jonathan, fears God. And guess who Jonathan finally sees? David. And Jonathan, a man who fears God, sees David, another man who fears God, and they become friends. So it's this picture here that God uses Jonathan here to strengthen David in his most weakest times that he'll face here. So it's not a random account of David, Saul and Jonathan, but you see it's painting the picture here of even the king of Israel disobedient before God. And yet there's this random man, Jonathan, who fears Yahweh. And this man, Jonathan, sees another man, David, who fears Yahweh and they become one at the hip, friends, because they realize they both fear this Yahweh. So in First Samuel chapter 13, you see how it begins to play out. Because this is one of the sins that, that Saul committed when he was going before to fight the Philistines. And he had to offer a sacrifice. But look what he does here. Verse 8 of chapter 13, I'm sorry, verse 8 of chapter 13. 
Now, Saul, he waited seven days according to the appointed time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, oh, you know what? Just bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him and to greet him. But Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the appointed days and the Philistines were assembling at Michamish. That therefore I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not asked the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Now you think in his own heart, well, I did what was best. Samuel's not coming. The, the, the enemies, they're coming around here. The Philistines are come down and get us. Let me just offer this burnt offering. But of course, he has to be obedient to God's word. But did he do that? No. Verse 13, Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolish and you have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And guess what? It's not you. And the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So now you see Saul committing this great heinous sin by offering sacrifices instead of waiting for Samuel to offer the sacrifice as God has appointed. And here God has judged him for that. But then right after that, look at chapter 14. This is the random turning of events where Jonathan comes in the picture. And look what Jonathan does. Now that day came that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who was carrying his armor, come and let us cross over the Philistines, Garristine, that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of, G- of Gibeah near the pomegranate tree, which was in M- Migron. And the people who were with him were about 600 men. And Ahijah, the son of Atiba, and Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the priest of the Lord at Shiloh, was wearing an ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to cross over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp crag on one side and a sharp crag on the other side. And the name of one was Bozes, and the name of the other was Sina. And the one crag rose to the north opposite, Mechemish, and the other on the south side, Giba. Now here you have Jonathan coming to the scene. He's preparing the, the, the way now, and he's setting up the territory. This is where the, the people were at. Verse 6, Then Jonathan said to the young man who was carrying his armor, Come, and let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps the Lord will work for us, for the Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few. Now, this is a bold effort here that Jonathan says, let's go against them because his confidence is not in Jonathan's strength. He says, the Lord is not constrained. The Lord can can slay by a few of us or by many of us. Here you see here, Jonathan is a man who fears God and realizes that God is able to slay by many Or by few. He trusts in God. And what does God do? He honors it and they win. Verse 14, if you go down, skipping a few verses. The first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within about a half a furrow and an acre of land. And there was a trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people, even the garrison and the raiders trembled, and the earth quaked so that it became a great trembling. So now you have here Jonathan coming in here in the backdrop of his disobedient father, and he's slaying many, and there's a trembling in the camp. And all because Jonathan is not afraid, but he trusts in God to do great things. Now, if you keep on moving now, Saul then commits another disobedience in chapter 15, when God tells Saul to go in and to completely destroy all of the Amalekites. He tells Saul, completely destroy them. Look at verse eight in chapter 15. I'm sorry. Um, Verse, yeah, verse 15, chapter 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has. And do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child, infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So what is God telling him to do? Completely destroy everything. But what does Saul do? Verse 8, he captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Verse 9, but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep 
the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly. But everything despised and worthless, what they were utterly destroyed. Now, God told them to destroy what? Everything. Everything. And Saul here thinking, well, this, this is some good stock here, right here. here. Let me just take him. Let me do what I think is right. And ultimately here, God punishes him for that. And so Saul, this disobedient king towards God, and you have Jonathan, this valiant warrior who honors and fears God. And then you see in the next couple chapters, then when David comes in scene and he fates this big old giant named who? Goliath. Goliath. And so now David comes on scene and he, what does he do to Goliath? He slays Goliath with a sling. And so now at this point now, Jonathan sees another man in the land besides himself that he couldn't even find his own dad, the king of Israel. He finds another man, David, who fears Yahweh and even slays the giant, not by his own strength, but by the strength of God. And so now after Goliath is slayed, look at chapter 18 of 1 Samuel. Now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as himself. Now you see this picture coming together where the seemingly random character Jonathan finds David. And they don't find him just for any old reason here. But what I want you to see here is how we're going to see just as we overview their friendship is how God used Jonathan's friendship for David to uphold him and to sustain him in the most trying times of his life that he would ever face. And friendship with Jonathan was just one of the means that God used to preserve David. Because not only did he preserve David with, with, with a friend like Jonathan, but he also gave him a wife who protected him. He also had his own providence of God on his side. But Jonathan was just one of the means that God used to preserve David in those trying times. So Yahweh here magnifies and defends David in several ways in the rest of this section. And with Jonathan is just one of the means that he does this. You see, Jonathan's friendship here is just one of the ways God uses to uphold him. And why it's crucial for us to see here is I'm going to pull out for us is to see how God uses godly friendship to sustain you in some of the most difficult times that you'll ever face in your life. Paul, not only did, did David need people, but even Paul needed people, the apostle Paul, because it's not just narrow here on just David. But all throughout scripture, you see God's people here and you see this picture of friendship rising up to support God's mighty men, such as even men like Paul. Real quick, keep your hand in in first first Samuel, but go to second Timothy. This letter here is the last letter written by Paul. As he writes this letter here, I want you to pay attention to hear the effect that godly friendship had on Paul and the effect that poor friendship had on Paul. But look at second Timothy. Chapter 1, verse 15. It's Paul saying, You are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well what services he rendered in Ephesus. So you have here, he says that what happened to him is that all who turned away from him in Asia, they turned away from him, like Phygelus and Hermogenes, that he was abandoned by these people who were, quote unquote, friends. But even more, he was refreshed by the house of Anisiphorus because he was not ashamed of him. He supported him. Go to the end of this book, chapter four, chapter four, verse 11, Paul saying only Luke is with me, but pick up Mark and bring him with you for he is useful to me for service. So here you have this picture that Paul himself was impacted by those who were quote unquote friends. And yet he was abandoned by them. But Paul himself was encouraged by those who were faithful friends toward him. This picture of friendship here was designed to support Paul. But yet you see the effect here. What happened when people who were quote unquote true friends were not actually true friends? God has made you a relational being. 
I want you to hear this. I'm spending time on this because I want you to be submissive to God's design. You must understand why is it even important that we talk about godly friendship? What does this even matter? What I want you to understand is that God made you a relational being. And especially in Christ, there is no way for you to live the Christian life in a healthy way without godly friends around you. So you must be submissive to God's design in friendship. That you need healthy friendships in your, in your life. So be submissive, your first resolution. Second resolution, be faithful. Be faithful. You need to be faithful. Now, there are a couple aspects here of this faithfulness that I want to look at. But be faithful, for one, in pursuing their good. Be faithful in pursuing their good. Oh, I can't take it off. Um, before we talk about what you should look at, In terms of who's a good friend towards you, I want you to think about how you can be a good friend towards others. Before we think about how can I make sure someone is a good friend toward me, I want you to think about how you can be a godly friend toward others. Be faithful in pursuing their good. A true hallmark of godly friendship is valuing the other person above yourself. Philippians chapter two, verse three says, consider others as what more significant than yourself, that a good friend is faithful in pursuing the other's good. That's a hallmark of true friendship. You even see that with David and Jonathan, because remember after um, David slayed Goliath, it says that that the souls of, of them were knit together. And it says that Jonathan loved him as himself. Even in the midst of David fleeing Saul's attempt to murder him, because if you remember from the story here that Saul tried to kill David multiple times. But look how Jonathan is seeking David's good, even while David is fleeing murder from from his own dad. Like, Like, think of that picture here. Like your own dad is trying to murder your best friend. But what is Jonathan about? What is he about? He is about seeking the good of David. In chapter 23, verse 15, says that now David, I'm sorry, first Samuel. Now David became aware that Saul had come out to seek his life while David was in the wilderness as if at Horish. And Jonathan, Saul's son, what did he do? Arose. He didn't stay with his dad. Knowing what his dad was going to do, he arose and went to David at Horish. And what did he do? He encouraged him in God. I want you to think about that picture here. That while his own dad was seeking to murder his best friend, he left and he went to David and he sought to encourage him. But he didn't just want to encourage David by telling David what he wanted to hear. Because how did he encourage him? I just said it. How did he encourage him? In God. He encouraged him in God. I want you to hear that here, that friendship is not about telling the person what they need to hear. But as a good friend, I need to encourage my friend and God. They may be going through things that you don't understand. They're struggling. But the one thing that I want to be as a godly friend is to encourage them in God. What does that look like? We don't know all that Jonathan said to David, but what might have it looked like? It might have looked like David. Yeah, he's seeking your life. But remember that God is a faithful God, that he kept you. You remember that battle with Goliath? He kept you, that even the giant couldn't overcome you because you're in God's hand. Now, even though my dad, the king of Israel is coming after you, Jonathan, God is a faithful God. He found David and he encouraged him in God. He was all about seeking David's good. And what was David's good? To know who God was. A faithful friend in pursuing their good, you are encouraging them in God. I want you to think about in your friendships that you have now. In your friendships, do you push the other ones toward Christ? Is your friendship marked as seeking to push the other one toward Christ? Is Christ seen as glorious in in the struggles and the difficulties and the upsets of life? Is your friendships that you have, is it marked with pushing the other one toward Christ? Looking toward Christ. Looking toward Christ. Are they pushing you to look toward Christ? Or are they pushing you away from Christ? Proverbs 27 verse 17 says that as iron sharpens iron, so one man what? Sharpens another. 
Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13 says to encourage one another day after day as as long as it's called today so that none of you will be dis- uh, hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That the scripture says you need to encourage one another daily. Why? Because it's so easy for you, believer, to be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You need to be encouraged by others and you need to encourage others daily. That pursuing the good of others, this hallmark of true friendship, you have to be faithful in pursuing their good. And their good is pushing them and directing their eyesight towards Christ. That if I want to be more like Christ, they want to be more like Christ, our friendship should look at pointing toward another, toward Christ. R. Kent Hughes, he said when he's speaking of this, this friendship between David and Jonathan, I like how, I like how he phrases it here. He says, true friendship seeks to make the other one royalty. Think about that. True friendship seeks to make the other person royalty. If you're thinking of David and Jonathan, Jonathan, keep in mind here, who's Saul's son? Say that loud with me. Jonathan. Say it out loud. Jonathan. All right, we're there. Jonathan is his son, right? And so who's next in line to be king, logically? Jonathan. Jonathan. But yet you see Jonathan preserving the life of David, even at his own expense. He's seeking to make David royalty above himself. True friendship is faithful in pursuing the other's good. Your friendship should be about what is best for them, for God's glory, even at my own stake. Christ likeness. So not only being faithful in pursuing their good, but you want to be faithful in your loyalty. Be faithful in your loyalty. In in 1 Samuel chapter 19. Chapter verse four says that then Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul. I love this, this portion here because Jonathan comes to his father (laughs) and knowing Saul, who was like, I don't know, like, could we call him bipolar? Like he's just flipping a switch. But Saul here, he is not stable at all. He's one man, one, one, one moment happy, another moment throwing a spear, trying to kill. But look what Jonathan does approaching his own father, the king of Israel, in spite of all that's going on. And he is bold enough to confront his own dad for his own sin. And think about it. If Saul's willing to just kill David, that's appointed man by God, who else will he, won't he kill? But look what happens in, in chapter 19, verse 4, when Jonathan goes to, to Saul. Then Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul. He spoke well of him. And said to him, Do not let the king sin against his servant David, since he has not sinned against you. And since his deeds have been very beneficial to you. Like, did you catch that? Like, this sounds pretty black and white. I was reading this narrative. But he's going to the king. He's going to his dad. And he's, he's talking to him, like, about his own enemy. He's like, don't let you, king, sin against your servant. Like, excuse me, sin. He has not sinned against you. His deeds have been very beneficial to you. That Jonathan is willing to go against his own dad and say, stop sinning. Like he didn't do anything towards you. And he has actually been very, very very beneficial towards you. That he is bold enough to confront Saul because he realizes it's sin what's going on here at the kingdom. He's not afraid of Saul, but because he fears God and he's willing to confront him in sin. Yes, of course, he's being respectful. He's honoring his father, but he is loyal to David because he's ultimately loyal to God. And he's saying here, he's confronting him with his sin is don't sin. That this true friendship is not only marked in pursuing their good, but this true friendship is loyal to do what is good. That a true friend doesn't just leave when it gets difficult. It doesn't leave when the conversations get awkward. But true friendship is loyal in doing what is right because ultimately it is loyal to God. And so he goes to him and pleads and says, Dad, this is wrong. And it says later in chapter 20, verse 12, we don't have time to look at it. It's how they made a covenant. This idea of covenant here is binding here. That this true friendship is marked with covenant friendship. That I will be loyal to you as long as you're loyal to God. And if we're loyal to God, there is nothing, no man that can break that loyalty. I don't know about you. 
But in the times of life, the most difficult times of my life, what I needed was a friend who was loyal to me. That even when it seemed everyone else was not loyal, that there was a friend that I can call, I can lean on, I can trust, who was loyal to me because we were both loyal to Christ. And it's in those relationships, those friendships that will allow you to thrive no matter what God brings your way. Do you have that marked sense of loyalty in your friendship? Of not only seeking the good of the person, but seeking to be loyal to that person by any means necessary. That this loyalty far extends any fear of man. Proverbs 17 verse 17 says that a friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for adversity. That a friend loves at all times. And you don't want to see when a brother is born? He's born for adversity. In other words, you realize who your true friends are when you start going through trouble. You hear me on that? Is that you want to find out who your true friends are? When it hits the fan, when trouble comes your way, whether it's heartache, whether it's pain, whether it's conflict, whether it's gossip, Whatever it is, who are the true friends that stick around when it gets difficult? Are they willing to risk everything for your good? The true friendship is not only about seeking the good of the person, but it's about that loyalty. Because that loyalty is tied to one another and it's grounded in Christ. And in that loyalty there, those brothers and sisters, even in adversity, it's going to be strengthened through that trouble. Because you realize as you're growing faithful to Christ, this other brother and sister who's growing faithful to Christ, who's shown faithful even when you were in trouble, even when they were in trouble, you were faithful toward them. You see those friendships get deeper and deeper and deeper in a way that no one else in the world can exhibit because there's no Christ there. But for those who are in Christ, you see that in trouble, true friends rise and true friends stick. You see who your true friends are. How does this look out in practical, in practicality? When there's trouble, when there's conflict, when there is heartache, when, whenever there's pain, whatever it is in friendship, you want to be the friend who is seeking to be loyal. And how are you loyal? It's even in the small things of sending a text message or talking to them, say, I've been praying for you. I heard about what happened and I've been praying for you every night. I've been consistent to lift you up before God in prayer, praying that the Lord would keep you and strengthen your faith through this. Is there anything that I can do to help you? There's sometimes, you know, the story of Job, you know, Job's friends who were around him when Job was in, in heartache, they were probably the best of friends when they were quiet because when they started speaking, they show themselves to be foolish oftentimes. That a good friend, a loyal friend, is one who will be with you and sit in silence. That maybe you don't even know what to say to comfort your friend. But the best thing you can do is to be with them and to be with them in silence. Romans chapter 12 verse 10 says to love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. That as a friend, you want to be loyal. And how can I outdo myself in being loyal and loving this other friend? You want to be loyal to them because ultimately you're loyal to God. Would you even think about in the secular realm? Think of the gangs, like gang culture. Gang culture, you know what draws many young men to young gang culture? Is because there's no sense of the brotherhood. There's oftentimes an absence of a father figure in the home and there's no brotherhood within the, within the relationship at home. And what attracts many young vulnerable men to gangs is that they see a loyalty there that they never had at home. And what's sad about it is they get that perceived sense of loyalty and brotherhood there. But you know what happens as soon as you cross the gang one time you're out. If you want to leave the gang and you want to get your, your life right and you want to get a job, you want to have a family, you want to leave the gang to, to build a healthy life, the only way out is by death. That's not loyalty. That's a false sense of loyalty. That's a demonic, I would even satanic loyalty because it says, it gives the facade here that you can be comfortable here and trusted here, but as soon as you cross us, I'm done with you. But Christian loyalty 
is built, built and rooted in Christ. And because Christ remains the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, that we can be loyal to one another in seeking your good, no matter what happens, no matter what comes your way. So not only seeking to build or do good for one another and being faithful in your loyalty, but you need to be faithful in your speech. Be faithful in your speech. Proverbs 29 verse 5 says that a man who flatters his neighbor is, is spreading a net for his steps. In other words, if you're one who just wants to tell your friends the good things they want to hear, the proverb says you're spreading a net for their feet. You're causing them to trip up and stumble. That you don't want a friend who just tells you what you want to hear. You don't want to be that friend who only says what's good so that they can like you more. If you're only seeking to say the things that are comfortable and safe so that the friendship remains intact and that you remain cool and you remain in, you lost sight of godly friendship. That a true friend says the hard things. You say the hard things. For Proverbs 27 verse 6 says that faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. That a true friend will say the things, and you know what? Those things may hurt. It may hurt if someone say, comes up to you and says, you know what you did there? How you talked to this person? You know, that was gossip. You, you, you talked about them behind their back, and then you went to them and act like yes, everything is okay. That, that, you know, that's gossip. That's wrong. For you to confront says, you know the way you speak to your parents? I've, I've noticed over time, like... Do you honor them? You know, scripture says we are to honor our parents. You're cheating on that test. I can't cheat. No, that's, that's a sin. That's a sin against God. Now hear me in this. I think oftentimes in Christian circles, especially when you have a high view of scripture, we don't have a problem of calling out sin in other people's life. But what I think we have a problem with is that sin that we're calling out in other people's life, has that sin that you called out been preceded by a true love of faithfulness and loyalty to that person? So that when you call out even sin in their life, does that friend know without question that you love them? Do they know first and foremost how loyal of a friend you are toward them? Proven loyalty? That you have proven their, to seek their good over your own good? Do they know without question that you have love for them unconditional? So that when you do have to confront them in sin, do they know that this person loves me? Hear me, I want people in my life, and I do have people in my life, who tell me things I don't want to hear. They tell me sin in my own life. They tell me things that I've done wrong. And you know what? My flesh doesn't always want to hear it, but I want to hear it because you know why? I want to look more like Christ. And you know what my problem is? I don't look more like Christ. I, I, I don't look like Christ as I should. And I want people who are willing to wound me because it's coming from a friend. So you want to be a faithful friend, who's faithful in your speech, who's not only loyal and seeking their good, but you're a faithful friend who is willing to speak truth to them and that truth is spoken in love. At the same time, those friendships that are happening there, you want to make sure here is there's no question that this person loves me. I mean, I, this person knows I love them. That do they know it's coming from someone who cares about them? You need this sanctifying help. If this friendship is grounded in Christ, you realize I don't look like Christ and I need those people who will point me and show me where I don't look like Christ, but even more will speak the truth to me in love. Ephesians chapter four, verse 29 says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Think about your speech with your friends. Is your speech seeking to give edification? In other words, is your speech seeking to build one another up? Do you seek to build one another up by your words or are you seeking to tear them down? One thing that I've seen and I notice many times in Christian circles is how much sarcasm and joking is not really friendly joking. Now, I say this out of conviction because if you know me well, I'm very sarcastic at times. It's like my second language. But there is a difference between this joking sarcasm and really just the biting, sinful sarcasm that Scripture talks about. Where you are, what you're saying is like you say the most hurtful thing 
to someone, but then you're like, Haha, I'm just kidding. Uh, what? And the person doesn't receive it as a joke. Like, it's a teasing, it's a joking, it's sarcasm here, but it's not really just joking. That really it comes from the heart here. And that's where I think is our danger, is these, these friendships, because I don't want to say anything that's good and, and gives grace to the moment. I don't want to look, I don't want to stand out. But here, Scripture says that we should be those who are marked as giving edification, marked as building one another up, marked as seeking the good of the other person. In other words, to give grace to those who hear. So along those lines, not only being faithful and seeking their good and their loyalty in your speech, but be faithful in your tact. Be faithful in your tact. In your tact. T-A-C-T. You can be hardy at the wrong time. And what I mean hardy, you can be joyful at the wrong time. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 14 says that he who blesses his friend with a loud voice early in the morning, it will be reckoned a curse to him. You think about it now, early, early camp mornings, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., and then you have someone who comes in your cabin while you're sleeping. Good morning! Turns on the light, opens the curtains. Good morning, everyone! You're like, can you please get out of here? Like, that's not, that's not hardy to me. I don't want to hear that. Proverbs is essentially saying here that a hardy word given in the wrong moment is like an insult. That if your friend is struggling and you walk in and like, life is really good. I'm really happy. I'm really joyful. And they're over here broken hearted. That's not a friend. A friend is sensitive to the heart and the disposition of their other friend. Proverbs 25 verse 20 says, like one who takes off a garment on a cold day or like vinegar on soda is he who sings songs to a troubled heart. If someone is grieving, if someone is going through something, and you come up with joyful songs, it's like vinegar to the soul. Proverbs 26, verse 18. I love this, this proverb here. It says that like a madman who throws firebrands or arrows in death, so is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, was I not joking? <laughs> so in other words, you get this picture here. You got a firework and you got like a firework and you launch it at your, at your friend's house. And then it goes in the house and the, the house sets on fire and that's the whole house burns down. And you're like, Haha, it's okay. I was just joking. It's just a firework. <laughs> and you're the only one laughing. Like that's the whole idea is that that's what a friend is like is the one who just gives this, this just dripping sarcasm. And I'm like, I was just kidding, man. And their soul has been crushed by what you said. It's not joking at that point. We got to be faithful in our tact. Is how we speak to one another. Is it seeking to build them up, seeking to encourage them? And how much does the joking culture in our Christian circles has gone too far beyond joking? What about even outstaying, overstaying one's welcome? Proverbs 25, verse 17, it says that let your foot rarely be in your neighbor's house or he will become weary of you and hate you. In other words, don't overstay your welcome. <laughs> Don't overstay your welcome. There, I mean, you have to be respectful of your other of your other friend's time. Treat others more significant than yourself, right? But don't be respectful of them. Don't overstay your welcome. And even more, by application, we can say, don't force your friendship on someone else. Just because if they don't want to be your friend, don't force yourself upon them because it's not about you. You have to be mindful of others. You will find here as that you are seeking to be a good friend, as you're seeking to be submissive to God's design, you're seeking to seek their good, you're seeking to be loyal, you're seeking to be faithful in your speech, you're faithful in your tact, you will find yourself as you are that faithful friend, God will providentially have you find other Jonathan or Davids in your life where you will see other godly people who fear God and you will cling to one another because of your, your likeness and seeing Christ exalted and you will establish those God friendships. But if you focus then on me being that godly friend, me being faithful and submissive to God, you will see God providentially bring others who are like-minded and you will cling to them and develop those friendships for life. So not only do you want to be submissive, to be faithful, but thirdly, be intentional. I'm going to spend just a couple minutes on this time, but be intentional. Be intentional. And what you, what I mean by that, be intentional in your pursuit for friendship. Because what's oftentimes the obstacle here in, in you finding godly friendships is not just about the practicals. Like, how do I build friends? I don't think we need help in that so much as understanding the philosophy of what God has designed in friendship. In other words, I'm saying is the problem is not a practical problem. 
The problem is a heart problem oftentimes. Because how are you viewing friendships and how are you pursuing those friendships? But if you understand those first two resolutions, it really flows out in this intentionality. So you need to be intentional. Be intentional with your pursuit. Place yourself in environments where you can build these godly friendships. Place yourself in environments where you can build that. You have the prime opportunity here at camp. There's an opportunity here at camp where you see other godly Christians. You have your youth groups at church. These are just essentially the context here. Like it's not magic. You show up to youth group and you get four friends. It's not magic. But these are context here where it's designed for you to be other around other godly men and women who also love Christ. And as you're around them, you're placing yourself in those contexts where you can build godly friendships. So your focus is not just, I'm going here so I can have a friend, but I'm placing myself intentionally in context where I can develop godly friendships. You have to be purposeful. Be purposeful in that. How purposeful are you in placing yourself in arenas where you can develop godly friendships? Be willing to get hurt. Be willing to get hurt. You may say, you know, I've tried this, but I got hurt. I tried this. With, with, I tried having Christian friends, but you know what? It doesn't work out. They hurt me. They talked about me. They backstabbed me. They gossiped about me. But you know what? Jesus got hurt too. Judas betrayed him. Peter betrayed him. But Jesus was faithful in doing what is right. Your Lord got hurt. Just because you get hurt doesn't mean you flee from God's good design in godly friendships. You got to be intentional with your vulnerability. Be, be intentional with your vulnerability. And these godly friendships, there must be some essence of authenticity. I'm not saying you need to air your dirty laundry with everyone, but there should be at least a couple people in your life who know the real you, who know what you struggle with, who know how to pray with you, who know how to follow up with you, who know how to hold you accountable. There should be at least a couple friendships, a handful of friends who know you well. This doesn't mean like you tell everybody your struggles, but there should be some people in your life who know the real you, who can ask you the hard questions. How are you doing in this? How are you doing with that? <laughs> My dad said this the other day. He was, Take, the, take it with, with a joke, but he said there should be at least one person in your life who knows enough about you to put you in jail. <laughs> they know enough about you where they can put you in jail if they, if, they, if they could. But the whole point being is that there should be people who know the real you. Godly people who know the real you. You need to be vulnerable. Be intentional in your vulnerability. And even more, you want to build friendships with people who are not like you. People who are not like you. If you're only going after friendships because they, they like you, that you guys like the same things, they talk like you, it's easy around them, that's, that's wrong. Go after people who are not like you. There are times I have friends in my life who are different than me, but I appreciate their friendship because they think about things the way I don't think about it. Like, I wouldn't have thought about that. But God has gifted them differently than he's gifted me, and I appreciate those friendships. Four, this fourth pursuit, last pursuit, is you need to be reasonable. Be reasonable. Be reasonable with your emotional capacity in need of God's help. Don't try to leave here and gain 100 new friends, right? Don't, don't try to leave this session now and like try to be friends with everyone here at this camp. But here, if you struggle with developing these good godly friendships, here's what you can do. You first need to ask the Lord for help. Pray and ask God, give me a love for people. Because that's really the issue here, is that do I love people? And this love is not just this emotional love, but it's this unconditional love, willing to do something for good for someone else at your own stake, for your, I mean, at, your own, at the expense of your own well-being. That loving others is seeking their good. So ask, and pray and ask God, give me an increasing love for people. And even more, Lord, help me as I pursue this, place godly friends in my life. Pray and ask God to give you help and a growing love for people. So be be reasonable with your emotional capacity and needs of God's help. Also be reasonable with your time. Be reasonable with your time. Because I don't want you to think here now that you need to leave here and and almost like 
Okay, I need to establish these, these, these new friends. I need to meet with them every week. I need, to, I, need to, I need to follow up with this. I need to set up these new disciplines. Now, yes, you may need to. But what I'm saying here is be reasonable with your time. In other words, there are plenty of opportunity that you already have in your life where you can maximize the time you have with those friends to develop these godly friendships. Does that make sense? Like there, there's plenty of opportunities you have when you're around other godly individuals and your other, your friends that you already have now, other godly friends where you can maximize that friendship where often times when you hang out, it's just about superficial things. It's just about the easy stuff. And how many times do we just use those hours and hours on vain things, maximize the time you already have with your friends and make it beneficial. Even just asking them, oh yeah, how can I pray for you? Any updated prayer request? You know what the Lord has been teaching me? The, uh, the Lord has been convicting me on this. Be the one to initiate the fruitfulness of the conversation. You be the one to, to ask for help. Can you be pray, for, for, pray for me in this? Anything I can be praying for you on? You know what the Lord is teaching me? You want to be the initiator to establish what the context of this relationship is. So maximize the time you already have with your friends and use it for fruitful purposes. So be reasonable with your time. Maximize the time God already gives you with those friends. And also be reasonable with your expectations. Be reasonable with your expectations. Because look here, don't expect here for you to implement these things. And then if you get discouraged or upset that you're not getting godly friends, then I want you to pause and think. If you're upset because you're doing all these things and you're not getting friends in return, is your focus on yourself Or is your focus on others? Many times we get upset because I don't have any friends. I'm doing all this and no one is reciprocating. It may be that you're more focused on what you can get than you being the good friend. You get me here? Is that you have to be reasonable with your expectations. Don't expect people to be as good as a friend towards you as you are towards them immediately. You can't expect that. You need to be patient with others. And so you still seek to be faithful to be their good friend because you love Christ. And even if they don't reciprocate, you still seek friendship and you are not discouraged because your goal is not on your own self, but upon others. Lastly, be reasonable with where you find your ultimate satisfaction in friendship. Be reasonable with where you find your ultimate satisfaction in friendship. So at the end of the day, God has given you godly friends to thrive in the Christian life. But friends or people are not your ultimate satisfaction. Your ultimate satisfaction must come from Christ. He is your true friend. The proverb says there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That Christ must be your ultimate true friend. He is the one whom you talk to before you talk to any of your friends. He is the one you consult before you ask anybody for advice. Christ must be your true friend and your ultimate friend. He is the one where you get ultimate satisfaction from. And in his own providence, in his own design, he's given other Christians to support you. But Christ must be your ultimate friend. Do not seek to get ultimate satisfaction from people, but from Christ. John chapter 15, 15 says that no longer, Jesus speaking, do I call you slaves. I have called you friend. If you're in Christ, Christ is your friend and he must be your supreme friend. When I was in college and I was kind of now on the cusp on my own in adulthood making decisions. And I still look back on one of the friendships that God has given me while I was a friend. And one of my friends, his his, his name's Travis. And we're still friends this day. Still now 20, almost 24, 25 years. I'm sorry. Uh, can't do math now. Uh, 12, 12 years removed from college, we're still like best friends. We don't meet every day. We don't talk every day, but we talk regularly. And it looks different because now we're in a different stage of life. Like we, we both have kids, we're married. We just, it looks differently, but the friendship is still there. But you know what I remember as I look back in college on our friendship? I don't remember everything that we were struggling with. I do remember some things, but you know what I remember when I look back on that friendship we had in college is we would always encourage one another with Matthew 6.33. And that's what I basically remember from our friendship. Matthew 6.33, when Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. 
When I look back, we were going through in college, like girl problems, like girlfriend problems, like all these things, money problems. Where are we going to, where, where am I going to, where, where am I going to find a job? Where's my career at? What am I going to do with my life? And we would just go through just different struggles. And I remember in that friendship, what we, what we kept doing to one another is reminding one another of after that conversation, we always be like, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things be added to you. Every single time I just remember time and time again, I'm picturing him standing there. It's like, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All these things to be added to you. And you know what that did for me? It's in my struggles and not knowing who's going to be my wife. Where am I going to work? What's my life going to look like? All these struggles that we went through as young men, I remember seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That God used that friendship in my life to remind me it was most important that I needed to seek Christ. I was so focused on all these external things, on money, on girls, on living, on all these things. But my friend reminded me what I needed most. I needed to seek first Christ and his righteousness. And sure enough, God did add all these things. He provided our needs. But I look back on that friendship and I remember, I thank God for Travis. He's still in my life to this day. And one of my loyal friends, I know I can always talk to And it's because it's marked with true godly friendship. You need godly friends. Seek to build those friendships and maintain those friendships and nurture those friendships for the glory of God. Father, we do thank you and we ask your help in this. That you would give us the right heart, the right understanding, and that you would use friendship in in their lives to build them up in the faith, to sustain them through the most difficult things that they'll ever face, but ultimately, Lord, to make known the glory of Christ within those friendships. So, Father, I pray for them that they would go and leave and find and build and maintain and nurture those good, godly friendships for your name's sake. We ask for your help in this pursuit because we can do nothing without you. In Christ's name, amen.